Well, I want to say hi and, and welcome to this webinar. Um, we're going to be focusing on the topic of real world data for COVID-19, especially around the collaborations between um, health systems and pharma and how we can come to solutions faster. Um, I'm Dan Hausman and I'm co-hosting from Graticule uh, along with uh, Roman from uh, Medixprim, who you can see on the line. Uh, Roman's going to share a couple introductory remarks and then we're going to jump into the content of the panel discussion. Hi, so my name is Roman Casavant and I'm the CEO of Medexprim. On behalf of Medexprim, I'm particularly honored to introduce this webinar. First of all, I would like to thank our participants who all very quickly agreed to be with us today. I would also like to thank our partner Gratico who coordinate the American part and the real world data reference material. It all starts from our MIDAC initiative in Europe one month ago to create a data lake in partnership with 20 European hospitals to diagnose and predict COVID-19. Then we told ourselves with gratitude that we could not stop there and that we had to anticipate the second wave, which is likely to arrive this autumn. And that's why we converge on this theme of how to transform our diagnostic platform into a platform that would also be able to host a large part of the clinical trials that will emerge in the next coming weeks and months. The ideal, of course, will be to be able to reuse the data collected to allow us to define a synthetic arm, which will have a huge advantage of focusing on future vaccine and treatment candidates to compare results. I don't know if there is other comparable initiative that could bring Europe and United States together around a single objective, which is to save as many lives as possible. Frankly, if this initiative allowed us to save just one life, we could be proof of the joint critical and extreme project. Thanks again for your participation, and I sincerely, sincerely hope that at the end of the webinar, we will have as many elements as possible to build this platform against COVID-19. Enjoy your webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Um, a quick um, piece of housekeeping. There is a Q&A tool built into the Zoom webinar. So our plan is to hold the panel discussion, but please feel free to enter questions at any time during the discussion. Um, the panelists can see the questions, so we may pull some of the questions during the dialogue or we'll hold them towards the end. Um, we'll probably be running you know, close to 75 minutes. Our plan is to wrap up the panel discussion within the hour. Uh, time is, of course, very relative because we're dealing with people on the east coast of the US, west coast of the US, as well as folks in Europe. Um, and so everybody's in their own time zone. So I definitely thank everyone for, for accommodating the times we, we, we found would work for everyone. Um, the topics we're, we're really looking to cover here are about global collaboration uh, around real world evidence for COVID-19. Um, I'd like to introduce our three panelists, um, Tom Skarnikia, Sheng Feng, and Ricardo Balazzi. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves because I probably couldn't do justice to their backgrounds. Um, maybe I'll, I'll quickly start with you know my background and why I'm here uh, working on these projects. Uh, at our company at Graticule, uh, we are focused on advanced real world evidence, uh, which really means the kinds of data that's hard to get to beyond the data sets like claims and some limited electronic health records uh, groups have been able to use in the past. And so we've been working in initiatives around imaging, free text notes, genomics. Um, and as COVID's come out, you know, we've seen it to be an area where there's, you know, an especially high interest in finding novel ways to accommodate research and analyses around patient data. Um, and so we're working hard to work with our partners uh, to find ways to make information available. A lot of the partners are very busy, I'm sure. Dr. Balazzi can explain how things look in Italy and uh, Sheng Feng can describe how things look in Asia. But you know, we're, we're trying the best we can to pull together the tools that are necessary to 
um, figure out what's happening with COVID-19. So I'll start with Tom. Maybe you can introduce yourself, take a few minutes to describe your background and, and sort of how you fit into this space. Yes, certainly, thank you. So I'm Tom Skarnakia, and I'm the co-founder of Digital Aurora. I work with life science companies, or research foundations, and health systems to inform their strategies around real-world research, very broadly defined around real-world data, real-world evidence. That includes strategies for data, platforms, and partnerships that are required to generate a wide range of real-world data-driven operational and evidence needs. As part of our work, we have designed and launched multiple public-private partnerships that are focused on real-world research networks. That includes a role that I played several years ago as the executive director for the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership. I'm a software engineer by training, and I uh, have a long career as a CIO and a technology strategist. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Sheng? Sheng, you're muted. Sorry. I think we have to. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sheng Feng. Uh, I'm a data scientist uh, from Praxel. Um, I got my PhD in statistics and uh, bioinformatics uh, 16 years ago. Uh, after that, uh, I joined the faculty of uh, biostatistics and uh, bioinformatics in Washington University in St. Louis and uh, later the Duke University. Uh, eight years ago, uh, I moved to uh, pharmaceutical industry, joined uh, Biogen uh, and later Apple V. Um, so two years ago, I went to China uh, and helped uh, Praxel uh, to build their RWD uh, team uh, in China and in APEC. Um, so from, um, from, uh, from late January, I have been involved in many COVID-19 clinical trials, uh, first in China, then in the USA. Uh, Real-world data has been widely used in both countries during the pandemic. Uh, so far, um, there are uh, about three popular use cases, like in uh, help, help uh, clinical trial designs and to accelerate the decentralized clinical trials, and third, to monitor and manage the mild patients, reopening the society. So uh, I do believe that uh, RWD and RWE will play more and more important roles in fighting against COVID-19 and when we are trying to get ready for reopening the society. And we can discuss more later. Thank you, Shen. Uh, Dr. Balazzi? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Riccardo Bellazzi. I work uh, at the University of Pavia. I'm a bioengineer as a training. And uh, I'm actually heading the department of uh, electrical, computer, and biomedical engineering. I also have an appointment from uh, a hospital here in Pavia called uh, Maugeri Hospital uh, that is uh, involved in, the, uh, in this uh, pandemic uh, disease. And uh, uh, within the hospital, uh, we are uh, working since uh, almost 10 years in order to be able to use uh, uh, the data that are collected during clinical practice to support research activities. So uh, real world evidence data. And uh, we started a number of projects uh, around this topic in particular because my department at the university became a, an academic partner of the I2B2 initiatives, uh, initiative in the United States of the academic user group. And with this group, we organized several conferences uh, uh, all around Europe, too, uh, to talk about the I2B2 technology as uh, one of the interesting technologies that are in, the, in this game. And um, I need to also to add that uh, some years ago, uh, a group of uh, my former students started a company that works on uh, the basically this topic of uh, data data we use to support research. The company is called Biomics. And um, recently, uh, after the, the, 
there was this uh, disaster pandemic uh, uh, disease. Um, I also tried to, to give and help with my know-how. And uh, so uh, at the Fondazione Maugeri, at the Fondazione Maugeri Hospital, at the Maugeri Hospital, we started uh, an initiative to collect data about uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, we also participated uh, together with other groups uh, in, uh, in Bergamo and in Milan to the initiative called 4CE. That is uh, uh, initiative for, it is headed basically by Harvard Medical School for the collecting data about COVID-19 and made them available to uh, researchers. So far, the initiative deals with aggregated data. So that's basically why I'm here. So I think a lot of people are curious um, about what things are like in Italy, because Italy and China were sort of the earliest spots that we heard in the news about COVID-19. Uh, and so I'd, I'd be curious to hear sort of your on the ground view of how data and informatics has been working in Italy, and also to hear uh, Shen's perspective on, on China and the Asia Pacific, you know, what's gone on and how things looked. Sure. So uh, first of all, uh, you need to, uh, well, you know, because it's now a problem that it's, it's a pandemia, so it's everywhere, but we were one of the first after China that, that had this problem that was really a sort of systemic challenge. So systemic challenge means that the, the entire healthcare sector in a way has been really challenged by these, uh, uh, by, the, by the disease, this outbreak that was so uh, violent, so sudden that uh, many people have been surprised by it. And, um, so uh, the, the system, uh, uh, the healthcare system in Italy, you need to know that it's a public healthcare sector, but the providers uh, are both public hospitals uh, or public services and the private ones. But after the outbreak, uh, the idea was to redesign completely the system in such a way all the hospitals were supposed to collaborate together. So, uh, sort of uh, uh, send patients from one hospital to another one, close departments, open new departments in order to be able to deal with the pandemia. And for this reason, you can, you can figure out how hard was to keep track of what's going on also from the point of view of the data. Uh, of course, we have billing, billing data that are uh, shared by all the hospitals and those are collected by the region and centralized. But these real world evidence data that we might need to understand much more are really hard to get when everything is changed, the organization is changed and all the system is changed. So uh, what happened was that uh, anyway, each of the hospitals understood that it was important to manage the data or to keep track of what's going on also the, at a good level of detail so they started the data collection, you know, in a sort of uh, uh, decentralized way, let's call it in this way. So in a way that sometimes turns out to be Excel files or small red cap, for example, projects to collect data on them. Um, all of those uh, are uh, dispersed in a way in the different centers. So uh, when, uh, when I had to start working with that with my colleagues at the hospital, it turned out that we had to go back and take a look at the data where they were collected, try to include them and merge them into our system for keeping track of uh, <clears throat> what's going on at the hospital uh, with I2B2. And uh, we have been sort of successful in doing that. And uh, the hospitals which already had a system to support this kind of research activities, of course, had a better position if compared with the others. I want to mention in particular Bergamo Hospital because they, it was, that was one of the hospitals that was really sort of invested by this wave of infections. And uh, notwithstanding that, they were able to start uh, an initiative called the COVID Lab, where they basically integrated the data that were, they were able to collect. And also the Polyclinic of Milan did that. 
But this was possible because previously there was an investment on designing good infrastructure for, for uh, managing the data. Probably one thing that I can add to the, to the story is that a, a big issue that we had here, that we are still having here in, in, in uh, Italy and in particular in Lombardia, where we had such a lot of huge uh, number of infections, is that some of them uh, were happen in the um, in territorial hospitals or in uh, um, in uh, in uh, these uh, uh, units that nurse some some something like nursing homes uh, that manages elderly elderly people, and sometimes those are sort of disconnected with the rest of the healthcare sector or not well or properly connected. So one important lesson learned is that also from the point of view of uh, collecting data and making connection, we should work much more on uh, embedding, you know, our uh, management of citizens at home into the uh, data system that we have for managing uh, patients uh, in the region. So let's say that probably if uh, I can add uh, a, uh, a, a critical point that is known, uh, while Lombardy in particular, where I live, has very excellent hospitals, um, maybe there, there has been put too much attention on hospital care, and we have lost the, our uh, interest towards uh, managing in a better way primary care and small hospitals uh, and nursing homes. Uh, and, and connecting them also from the data point of view. Thank you, uh, Ricardo, that was fascinating. Um, Sheng, can you, can you give a perspective from China? Yeah, um, so uh, oh, what uh, just described happened in Lombardy uh, happened in the city of Wuhan as well. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a chaos at the beginning. So COVID-19 began in the city of Wuhan uh, at the end of December of 2019, a time when the field of RWE were ready to boom in China. Uh, in fact, uh, just on January 8th, the Chinese FDA uh, just published the first national guidance of RWE in clinical trials. Uh, that was one week after the first COVID-19 patient was reported and the two weeks before the city of Wuhan was locked down. Um, so many life science organizations and uh, big data companies uh, were just excited uh, by the publication of uh, such a national RWE guidance uh, and thought now that um, their time had come <laughs> uh, before being asked to stay home uh, for three months uh, and, and, uh, um, and it's really slowed down. So. Uh, what I observe is that, uh, uh, um, well, uh, well uh, the major contribution from those uh, life science companies and big data companies in terms of RWE, are uh, one, uh, that is a decentralized clinical trials, uh, as just explained in Italy as well. Um, there are gigantic RWD data has been generated. Uh, such as EPRO. Um, so they are generated from smartphones, from dig uh, digital device uh, and the wearables. And the two uh, is to uh, monitor and uh, uh, managing asymptotic and mild patients. And they are moving freely uh, in the society. So that is very important uh, during the pandemic uh, to flatten the curve and also after the pandemic, like after the city of Wuhan was reopened um, a few, uh, three weeks ago. Um, so those uh, RWD was to find and track the random uh, small scale outbreaks. Yeah. And the third one is uh, for clinical scientific research. Uh, for example, um, one life science company uh, applied artificial intelligence assistant CT to screen and monitor COVID-19 patients. Um, so uh, that's, um, and uh, 
I I did see that uh, some data sharing is happening uh, uh, between China and the uh, others uh, other part of the world. Um, for example, there are some seminars uh, with a title uh, "What Did We Learn from China?" So some of the uh, some of the parameters from medical doctors like um, how far away from a patient get uh, from uh, from the first symptom to uh, first diagnostic, from the diagnostic uh, to ventilator to hospital. Yeah, so those parameters and the percentage uh, from uh, from the patients can be used uh, to design a better clinical trial. Yeah. So, so Tom, I know you're working with multiple life sciences organizations, and I'm, I'm curious, what are the questions they're trying to answer with RWE? What's sort of the the, the goal that they present to you with their research? I think it's, it's, it's important, first of all, to recognize that um, COVID-19 has really disrupted their clinical trials. Um, and that's a combination of health systems reprioritizing their resources towards the crisis. And biopharmaceutical you know, organizations are, are in, you know, have shifted to work from home situations. So they've really had to kind of begin to look at the concept of a digital transformation for trial operations. And I think this crisis is really kind of getting them thinking about it. And, and certainly we're getting questions um, about you know, who, you know, what type of resources are available um, from a technology and from a service standpoint to support that. But you know, more specific around real world data, um, we're seeing biopharma firms um, really putting an emphasis on prioritizing their immediate RWD and evidence activities to support their own COVID-19 development programs, particularly the firms that, that are bringing therapeutics um, forward in that space. And so much of the work is focused on informing study design and feasibility. They're also looking for you know, biomarkers and indicators of disease progression um, in the data, as well as just understanding the target populations and the underlying factors for the disease. So it's the things that you would normally look for from a public health standpoint, as well as for planning trials. Um, interestingly enough, we are also seeing health systems respond to that with their own robust in-house real world evidence business units generating you know, insights and evidence, um, not only to kind of support their um, biopharma um, um, colleagues that are, that are conducting research, but maybe more importantly, to support caregivers in, the, in their leadership. Um, so most of, most of what we see from pharma is really thinking about how to kind of manage in this difficult time, their clinical trial portfolio and to um, to bring therapeutics forward um, into the in, into the fray regarding the crisis. Thanks, Tom. And, and Shane, you have probably a similar perspective at Paracel. Um, you know, what kind of uses and what sort of data are you seeing groups interested in? So, what does the COVID nineteen data set look like, and, and why? Uh, yeah. Um... So um, in Praxo, there are um, two, two different types of challenges. One is uh, for all the uh, COVID-19 uh, projects. There are so many of them. Uh, and uh, we spend a lot of time trying to help the clients. And uh, the other type is for other clinical trials uh, that is not involved uh, COVID-19, but they have some big impact. So they have been slowed down or some of the trials may be canceled. Um, so, so those are the two different types. So um, for the COVID-19, um, yeah, um, as Tom just said, that uh, uh, the number one use of uh, RWD is kind of like intelligence, trying to help our clients to design their clinical trials, uh, some, uh, like the feasibilities. Uh, as I just uh, uh, talked about, like those parameters. Uh, if someone is trying to do, you know, um, a drug re uh, repurpose, like to re repurpose a cancer drug, 
uh, into a COVID-19 drug, then what does the data look like? You know, um, uh, so for the patient, uh, for the cancer patients, uh, they they are in the risk of infection of COVID-19. Um, are there any publications and what are there any data? So we are, uh, so we use that and. Uh, uh, also, like if someone mentioned that uh, uh, if some diabetes drugs or hypertension drugs may may increase the likelihood of get infection with COVID nineteen, whether that is true or not, uh, we can we can look at the data. Um, and uh, some other data use uh, including um, part of the scientific data, uh, uh, including. Uh, like the uh, imaging data and also the diagnostic, uh, the diagnostic test uh, data. As you know, there are so many diagnostic tools on the market right now. So if you are preparing a multi-center clinical trials, uh, are the standard from those diagnostic tools the thing, like the false positive, false, neg uh, false negative, uh, false positive? <laughs> if the standard is not the thing, uh, if you are trying to enroll patients, uh, that will create a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, and also um, some of the uh, precision medicine concept, uh, um, like uh, for how uh, how the how the disease progress in the patients. Uh, there are some like the biomarker papers, uh, and also that uh, that is related to to your drug. Uh, so if the drug is a uh, autoimmune type of like a uh, the cytokine stone, then what type of patients do do you need to collect a biomarker? Yeah, um, before before you run your trial. So those are uh, some of the questions that may be addressed by uh, RWD uh, if the data is available. <laughs> if data is not available, the only thing you can do is to read papers. And talk to sci uh, to talk to scientists, um, and that can be uh, uh, varying a lot by who, uh, which KOL you talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, some other important thing uh, in uh, helping our studies is like the all those practical issues or what we call the pragmatic issues. So what happened in in each site? Yeah, inside. Uh, do they still have beds, or do they? Uh, how how many ventilators they have? Uh, can we send, even send the drug to the site uh, because of the quarantine and the lockdowns? Uh, yeah, and uh, if doctors and nurses they do not want the physical paperwork, uh, yeah, if they want the a uh, e copy of everything. Uh, is uh, uh, yeah? Uh, do we can can we uh, can we supply that? Yeah. So those are uh, some of the RWD we are collecting in addition to scientific uh, data evidence. Thanks, Shang. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bellotti, um Obviously, this is pretty challenging. What do you see as some of the blockers making it hard to make the data available? Um, you gave us some of them when you were just describing you know, the situation on the ground, but I'm, I'm curious what you're seeing is, is the big challenges to be solved. Uh, I think that <clears throat> there are at least two uh, types of challenges that we have to face with. First, of course, is data quality. Uh, because as I already mentioned, the, the data that are collected uh, during uh, these uh, waves of infections uh, are uh, you know, those that are needed to take care of the patient. So sometimes, uh, uh, considering the situations where ICU and emergency rooms are working, uh, it's difficult to uh, think about a high quality system for data collection. And uh, so many for many data, at least that we have had to deal with, uh, were on these notes uh, and we had to process uh, them uh, uh, using, for example, NLP. But then you need, you know, validation and you need to check and verify. And I also want to mention that uh, one of the challenges that was previously uh, talked about that is uh, basically the logistical information. So what was the scenario where these people were playing uh, is, is difficult to to measure because or to uh, have the data about 
because the, also the departments were uh, moving in a way. So as I told you before, some of them were closed, some of the hospital of the beds were added to others, uh, uh, and uh, the people that, uh, the, the, for example, clinicians or nurses, they were re, uh, their, their assignment were changed. So also all the um, process uh, for collecting data and taking care of the, uh, of the information has been affected by, these, uh, by this challenge because the entire healthcare process has changed due, due to the due to this uh, uh, disease. So I think that on the one hand, we have this issue of, uh, of uh, the poor quality data. And for this reason, probably to, in order to start with uh, a good data collection, we have to go with the low hanging fruits that are the labs, uh, uh, that are of course the billing codes, uh, and uh, that are that it is everything that is collected properly during the process of care, and then adding, you know, starting from that and ending backwards. Then, of course, we have an issue that is related in general to the IRBs. Uh, IRBs, of course, uh, are uh, there in order to avoid an improper uh, use of the data. And I need to say, in my experience, that they've been very flexible and excellent in trying to be fast, uh, helping those who were going to start with new, new initiatives. But at the end of the day, and it's a general problem with data, uh, when we collect data, we collect data in order to be able to answer to many questions, and not only one, or to uh, speculate and have uh, uh, ideas uh, around, uh, around the data and to look for other aspects uh, uh, while we are analyzing the data themselves. And sometimes uh, when we have to send our protocol to the IRBs, uh, those are uh, strict in terms of what you can do with the data. And uh, this is a general problem. Of course, it's not only a problem of uh, COVID-19, but of course in this case uh, where these, uh, the dynamics of ideas uh, may be very fast uh, because you start and you, then new knowledge arrives and something new is published in the literature and there's a real flow also of ideas and new concepts and, uh, and innovation. Uh, sometimes, you know, if a, a protocol is too strict then you are sort of blocked. You cannot go on with, uh, uh, with your uh, data analytic process. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, is somehow, somehow the second challenge that is particularly uh, important in this case. Thank you. Um, I'm curious too, uh, from your perspective, uh, Tom, have you, have you seen things that are challenging folks to try and get these COVID-19 projects working? Um, yeah, we, we, we're seeing organizations that really don't have the necessary fabric in place to uh, to build communities around the research questions um, have a heavy lift. And so, you know, the, the alternate view is, you know, the organizations and the communities that in fact have um, both the um, operational, legal, and the technical frameworks in place to, um, to do shared research are at a big advantage in this situation. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, if you look at some of the public-private partnerships and disease-specific research communities, they've got some good examples of, of, of being able to kind of spin up COVID-19 RWE um, programs. You know, you look at PCORI, for instance, um, in partnership with uh, DCRI. They've le leveraged the PCORNet real world um, data network to stand up their COVID registry in a matter of just a few weeks. And it's a national footprint. Um, what made that happen? Um, standard data model, standard terminologies, legal frameworks for sharing, ability to opt in, distributed nature where you're sending the analytics to the data instead of trying to centralize the data. We're seeing professional societies work across their membership um, using basic tools uh, like REDCap 
to build registries. And then the uh, open source and standards-based communities such as Odyssey and I2B2 on Transmart have frameworks in place to support uh, their health system um, members to rapidly opt in to shared research initiatives. And you know, those are two examples of having um, kind of shared programs up and running in late March. Um, while everyone else was still thinking about, you know, moving data. So, so to, to us, it's, um, you know, the, the barriers that we see and the obstacles that we see, um, you know, really kind of center on one, do they have a legal framework to do it, particularly if it has to cross borders? And, and two, to address kind of the velocity that's needed, you know, do you have the right standards and, and infrastructure in place to, to be able to rapidly uh, react to a research problem? without, you know, having to actually build capabilities. Thanks. And, and what's, what's your perspective on some of the, the big challenges and some of the solutions you've seen, Shang? Yeah, um, I like uh, the example that Tom had just gave, like the uh, PCORI. So it was uh, very impressive. Uh, the Duke University can start up their phase three clinical trial based on this registry like of 850,000 um, uh, doctors and nurses uh, in this network and that they can choose or, and, and they can enroll 15,000 very quickly. So that is a very good example to see how uh, RWD uh, is able to help. Um, what I want to uh, mention is that, uh, um, so when we talk about um, uh, multi-center and uh, especially in international clinical trials, uh, you know, with multi uh, uh, centers in uh, sites in different countries. Um, so, uh, what is the legal and the policy, uh, the, the legal consideration and the policies? Um, I, th I think we, um, the leaders are building that right now. Uh, early this month, uh, the regulators from 28 countries, they had a meeting um, and uh, they want to, uh, yeah, uh, and the title of the meeting is COVID-19 Real World Evidence and Observational Studies. So during that meeting, they claim that uh, they are going to, um, yeah, that they're go going to work together and, uh, and make that happen. Um, so, uh, so it is hopeful that uh, uh, let, uh, uh, after they set up the stage, um, and then uh, I think we, we will see more and more uh, collaboration uh, internationally. And, and, and Shen, what do you think about how are all these trials going to work if there's 100 trials all working with the same patients? Is, is there a way real world data can help with that? Uh, yes. Um, so in China, uh, there, uh, there were already 600 clinical trials. Uh, and uh, there are not enough patients. Uh, so currently I was, uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, no one can finish their clinical trial. And in the USA, uh, we heard from FDA that uh, by last Friday, there were already more than 900 uh, um, proposals sent to FDA. So there are a lot of uh, clinical trials. Um, so uh, one way, um, you know, um, I, uh, I don't know how those clinical trials will be run differently in the USA uh, versus in China, but they may run into the same problem. Uh, uh, two months later, uh, when they start their, their clinical trials, there may not be enough uh, patients uh, and the trials cannot finish. Um, so uh, I think NIH uh, and other uh, leaders, they are already uh, considering this, they have building those consortia like NIH has building uh, has worked with sixteen pharmaceutical companies, uh, and then there are some other. Uh, so, uh, when by doing that, they, they may share they may share a, a common placebo uh, arm, or they may not even use a placebo arm. Yeah, they can just use historical control uh, with uh, uh, with a stand uh, with a standard uh, standardized trials. So that can save a lot of patients. So RW. The RWE can play important roles in, 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 in something like that. Uh, for example, like the single arm 
uh, design and also the uh, uh, the synthetic arm if possible. Um, so that's some of the possibilities. And so one key word here is we need to be organized. Uh, it's not like 900 uh, individual clinical trials. It's better to be organized. Uh, and then we can share the resource together. Um, otherwise, uh, we are going to have uh, observed the same uh, consequence as what we observed in China. A uh, very few clinical trials can finish by now. And and maybe I'm just, I'm curious for everybody. Um, do you think that's something the government needs to do? Is it something that the CROs should do? Like, what's the right model? Maybe I'll I'll start with Tom because he's he struggled through many of these quasi public private partnership systems. And what do you think, Tom? Well, I, I, I do think the public-private partnership model um, will play an important part. Um, and as Shen has brought up, for instance, the NIH working with the foundation for the NIH, um, really able to use its consortia building power to, uh, to, to bring together a large number of pharma companies um, and academic institutions uh, to, to coordinate. Um, in a thoughtful way. And I think that that is, uh, I think that's an important model. And, and, I, and I think it, it, the public-private component of it is, is important. And I think having a trusted neutral convener to help manage through that's also very important. And, and how, how should life sciences companies, for example, think about waiting or acting? <laughs> So should they form all their own partnerships now just to get answers to questions and data, go all the way down to the individual health system, look to aggregators? Um, I'm curious from your perspective, maybe yours as well, Shang. Um, yeah, um, I, uh, well, um, I don't know um, the, uh, the best answer for that, uh, but I can, um, I can see that it's better that the life science companies like CROs, uh, we can be, we can engage in the uh, public private uh, foundation like uh, led by NIH or WHO. Uh, if we are doing the things just by ourselves, we may not have um, the appropriate authority uh, to crack down a lot of barriers or the ice walls. Uh, so we do need uh, a very powerful leader like NIH or WHO, like what the uh, solidarity uh, clinical trial led by WHO now. So it's covering more than 90 countries. Uh, it's impossible for, a pri almost impossible for a private company just uh, to, uh, to lead a study like that, but we can help. Yeah, we can help, uh, like to how to uh, collect the data and use a uh, user network uh, internationally and uh, to, to show them how RWD, RWE may help them. Uh, like, uh, for example, now the solidarity trial is, uh, is a, uh, we can say it's a 100% programmatic clinical trial. It's a PCT rather than a RCT. Uh, or the randomized uh, comparative clinical trial. So, it's, so how these trials can be run, and uh, um, so uh, there are a lot of uh, experience and of uh, the framework, and can uh, we can help the leaders uh, to, um, yeah. But but then we we need to show them that uh, you know when uh, when the NIH leader said that uh, we can do a single a single arm clinical trial. But how that is possible, you know, how the uh, RWD, RWE with the uh, historical data uh, and the external data, how that can help and uh, where are the data and what are the data quality? Uh, how are we going to work on that? So um, we can be proactive and work with them. So that is one way to be, uh, to, uh, to be engaged uh, other than to work by ourselves. Yeah, uh, that can, we, we have some um, real world <laughs> uh, experience uh, to work uh, ourselves in China. And uh, eventually uh, there are a lot of issues. Uh, maybe only the government or the WHO can solve, a private company cannot, yeah. So, so Dr. Balazzi, what do, what do you think about, so the yeah, topic of uh, making this work? In this topic, uh, uh, I can just add uh, one of the, 
problems that we are dealing with here in Italy. Um, that is in, in relationship of the private public uh, uh, initiatives, no? Because uh, uh, the healthcare uh, has been uh, structured in such a way is mostly managed by what we call the regions. And uh, so Lombardia region is where I live, then there's the Lazio region and so on and so forth. Of course, this problem of uh, pandemic uh, is a national problem. It's uh, an international problem, it's a world problem. <laughs> so uh, there's a tension in terms of the management of the, of the, uh, of this, uh, this, or even of the studies, uh, but also the in initiatives, strategic initiatives between the center and the periphery, because they both want to play a role. And so Lombardia region in particular is uh, very important in Italy because we have one sixth of the entire population. We are 10 million and uh, we are the richest area. So we pretend that we have you know, enough uh, power to manage our partner, uh, our partnership, even par private and public. And uh, while probably there, there we would need a national coordination in order to be really successful in doing that. So there's a tension between the two uh, and it's understandable why. Uh, it's not that I'm in favor of one solution to the other, but probably much better coordination would also help companies to find uh, uh, you know, a partner at a level that can really drive studies uh, with the dimensions that are needed uh, to gather evidence from a disease like this, that it's a very, uh, I mean, from the statistical point of view, it's a, a very challenging disease because of the variability that is, is extremely high. And so this implies the need of numbers that, and you only have numbers if you put together a lot of institutions. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm curious about what your, your visions are for how this is going to play out. Like, what's the future? And, and you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be the, the dark future. What would be an ideal state um, for really moving research along? So, Sheng, I'm curious from, from your perspective, you know, what, what's your vision for this future of RWE on, on COVID-19? Um, well, uh, we, um, I, I, uh, I still think uh, the public-private uh, uh, collaboration uh, will be the oh, will be the direction um, yeah so um, each part can play their roles uh, like the government and uh, they can help to open uh, uh, to, uh, to break down the barrier on the data sharing and uh, if they are talking uh, to the hospitals uh, and uh, talk to the other companies that may help uh, to uh, to collect the, uh, collect the data together uh, I'm, uh, I am talking about the uh, RWD and RWE uh, perspective. So that will help a lot. Yeah, and then the private company can, uh, can provide the techniques uh, and the brain mind and to make this happen. So I think that's, um, you know, from the high level, uh, uh, high level paths, yeah. That should make more sense. And, and have you seen anything that looks like this future? I mean, I know there's a lot of initiatives out there. I've seen data vans trying to link data together. There's different projects that, that you hear about, right? Right, right. Uh, we do hear uh, a lot of this uh, uh, co uh, co correlations like the uh, data vent. Uh, we are applying uh, their, uh, uh, the data and trying to do something and trying to answer some questions. Uh, so, um, but I, I, I think the format can be, uh, you know, uh, if we talk about the low level details, uh, I would recommend like something called the dream challenge uh, that has been famous in the past few years. Like uh, the organizer can ask a list of questions uh, about uh, COVID-19 and then uh, they can provide data like uh, work with uh, DataVent or Trainex or um, some of the companies to prov uh, provide the data and then to call for data scientists, statisticians, bioinformaticians to work together and see what kind of uh, what kind of uh, information they can uh, they can dig from the data. Uh, 
yeah so uh, so this type of activities may you know uh, to uh, to group the people together uh, uh, to bring some of the um, brightest mind together and, and uh, use the most recent and comprehensive data uh, to answer some of the most urgent questions that most urgent questions for example like uh, only last week you know there was a, a report saying that if you have a, a flu shot then you are 36 percent uh, you have a more a 36 percent higher likelihood of being infected by COVID-19 uh, so if we are talking about the second wave in the winter, you know, when the flu and uh, uh, COVID-19 come to us all together, this kind of answer is very important. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, so we can, uh, we can do something like that to list this, this question and then to, uh, to build an army uh, with, uh, uh, with the weapons, which are the data. To answer so, uh, and also you know we can we may help to um, help the pharmaceutical companies as a whole to uh, to to carefully uh, identify those uh, those parameters for them to design their trials. Like uh, if they want a master protocol, then what are the parameters in the master protocol? Yeah, so those uh, parameters uh, may come from a pilot study or it may come from uh, RWD and RWE. So that's something, um, uh, another thing we can help uh, urgently. So, so Tom, one thing that comes to mind, th thank you, Shang. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that comes to mind when I think of these big public-private partnerships is, you know, at least in my experience working with health systems, um, they're concerned that they don't have the funds or the resources, probably the resources are connected to the funds to participate in these things. Um, you know, how do you see that working given all your experience with, you know, the public private par partnerships you've been involved in? Like the economics seem daunting um, if you don't have a good structure. Um, I mean, I think that's, that is a, uh, uh, a fair concern. Um, you know, 10 years ago when we, um, 12 years ago when we launched OMOP, we essentially had to fund that infrastructure in all of our partners to be able to you know, bring their data into a common format, um, to create a research ready repository. I think things have changed and in, in I think the emergence of what we're seeing in the larger health systems, this notion of a real world evidence enterprise where data is being used to support decisions regarding clinical care. You know, they're, they're, it's, you know, it's being used to help demonstrate the value of their healthcare delivery. Uh, it's being used in a number of ways. Those organizations stand posed to, to be able to um, not only contribute to these broader um, initiatives from a, you know, from a data standpoint, but maybe more importantly, have you know, the organization to be able to deliver on some of the research commitments. You know, one of the, one of the challenges that I, I see repeatedly is when you approach a health system, for instance, and you want to talk to them about a data deal. They're much more interested in understanding what the research problem is and how they can contribute to the research problem. I also see a lot of, of, of potential in terms of these emergence of learning health systems. Um, years ago, one of the major health systems on the West Coast, they were participating in five or six different research networks and I asked them why. You know, they, they were in a position where they, they, they were really sort of a, uh, the gold standard in terms of research ready data. And their point was, well, to answer the type of questions that we have, we need more data than what we have. And so that means working in a community, working across organizations. And I think what Shen was pointing to is you have to start first thinking about the community and, and how to work together from a research standpoint. You need to put the governance frameworks in place and then you really have to think about the enabling technology and standards that lower those barriers. 
Um, and we're starting to see more and more of the mainstream um, EMR vendors and health IT vendors looking at how they can enable this network effect within their client base on behalf of their, their, uh, their health system um, clients. And I think that's the substrate to be able to enable this type of research in the future. Um, Ricardo, what are your thoughts? You know, how do, how do you fund this? Where, where does the money come I, from? I do think that, uh, yeah, the, if I, if I uh, want to wrap up what was my experience so far, I think that I, I fully agree that we have two important uh, aspects that we need to deal with. Uh, one is to uh, work on uh, uh, standards uh, and uh, frameworks that are uh, shared between uh, you know, the communities. And one of those is certainly OMOP uh, with the Odyssey initiative. Uh, I2B2 was another. Those are the initiatives that very fast were able to put together data, also because they worked a lot on uh, ontologies, on data representation, on standards, on the, on the way that uh, uh, the ways for really sharing data in a, in a, in a format that is agreed. The second aspect, uh, the, the aspect that I want to raise is that probably uh, we also may want to work with some better technologies to share the data or even better to perform distributed uh, data analysis over the network in a sort of concept of federating the centers participating to the studies in a very secure way. And in this case, uh, I want to mention the initiatives that are uh, carried on by the e EPFL in Lausanne and the University Hospital in Lausanne, where they are working on a strategy for, uh, uh, that is a sort of very secure strategy, so that in a federated network, uh, uh, the data are encrypted and the data analysis is performed on encrypted data only. Uh, this is done through a technology called homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. And that's very interesting because now we have available algorithms that are able to run and perform distributed data analysis to compute many uh, machine learning, uh, um, uh, let's say models, uh, to run man, many machine learning models. But at the same time, if we are uh, relying on very secure and high level uh, ways of, of uh, sharing the information, maybe we, are, we can be in one line from the technological point of view that allows to um, overcome the barriers that we might have in running such kind of studies. So, so Tom, I have a question for you because I feel like we've had this idea of distributed analysis since the days of Pop Mednet. Yet when I talk to the average life sciences company interested in a real world data study, they're asking, you know, how much data and what sort of type can you deliver to my server so I can do my analysis? Like, is there a disconnect here? Um, is there a solution to it? Um, <laughs> yeah, it depends on where you're sitting, if you could view it as a disconnect. I mean, a lot of the work that we do is around data strategies, helping life science companies find the appropriate sources to bring data in-house. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to look at in terms of, of just de-identified data. It's another thing to have research ready or regulatory grade data, which requires a lot of curation and data cleaning. And so there, there is a, a disconnect from the standpoint of the richer types of data types are not necessarily available through the normal sources. And so you have to you know, look at new ways of, of, of distributing the research. Um, and, and so the interest in networks is growing, not only from the standpoint of the life science companies, um, but the traditional players uh, around you know, the, you know, that have traditionally been the middlemen in terms of, of curating, making data available. So it, there, is, there is a disconnect because the easiest path to do analysis is to bring the data in-house. Um, but I think the future 
will be the more distributed models. And um, as Dr. Balazi mentioned, you know, we'll overcome a lot of, of the barriers around privacy and security with these newer technologies. Um, there is still room for a great deal of improvement around um, the federated distributed um, capabilities. You can't expect everyone to agree on one set of standards. So how do you semantically work across a variety of standards? And we've seen some work, but Corey has done some interesting work there across, um, across both I2B2 and in OMOP Odyssey and their own data models. So research is happening there. Um, but it is a mind shift change that's required. And uh, I think as the networks become more accessible and more standardized and are able to really articulate their value proposition, the conversation will change. Okay, well, I know we're, we're sort of out of time for the first hour. So I thank everyone for sticking around for an hour. Uh, who's in the audience. I did want to give everyone on the panel a chance to to share probably a call to action or their 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 thoughts. Um, so I'll um, I'll start with Sheng and uh, love to hear your your call to action. Uh, yeah, a call to action is um, um, so uh, if uh, um, if this uh, RWE uh, re regulatory uh, network uh, can uh, can bring us some um, some guidance and the policies uh, uh, in a very near future. Then, uh, then and I do think that uh, uh, the public and the private um, con consortia type of work uh, we can explore how to uh, how to build such a consortia uh, to bring the global data together. Yeah. And uh, how about from your perspective, Tom? What's your Sort of take away. Tom, do you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we hear you now. You might have gone over a sec. Uh, okay. So I you know I my big sort of takeaway and my hope for the future is this concept of uh, you know, a combination of the real world evidence enterprise within healthcare emerges. And then from the point, the concept of, of a real world evidence ecosystem um, gels around that. And uh, you know, to make that work, we do need to, to, to think about more than just the movement of data or access to data. We have to think about the governance frameworks. We have to think about the standards. We have to think about and the mechanisms to work across multiple stakeholder groups to do to do the type of work that's necessary in a compliant manner. Thanks, and, and uh, Dr. Balassi. Well, I, I share uh, the the for sure the thoughts of my colleagues and uh, Thomas uh, in particular. I just want to add to the, that scenario that we need to take into account the data that comes from primary care. And uh, we really need to work on improving our capability of uh, connecting into the system all uh, the healthcare services that are delivered to citizens or to people uh, in the in the territory, basically. So that's that's a ver that's very important. Primary care we need to include that in the in the scenario in order to be able to gather real world evidence from an integrated manner. Thank you. Well, um, this has been a great discussion so far. Um, I'd like to open up some of the questions or the, the audience if you, you do have questions for the panelists. Um, I see a, a couple so far, and I can sort of read one of them, and I, I guess I won't necessarily direct it, but the first is there's been discussion about OMOP and I2V2 for data exchange for research. Um, how do folks see fire emerging as a, a key part of this puzzle? And you know, how might it facilitate data exchange or aggregation to, to build up research capabilities? Um, I'll let any of you take that question. Well, where we've seen fire come into play is when you start to think about 
increasing the velocity of data from you know point of care to research ready, and so it, it has been a great uh, a great vehicle for making data more fluid um, and accessible. I think there there's still work to be done to understand if it is um, a powerful enough format to support the analytics that that we need around real world um, research. Um, and, and I know there's work happening there and there are networks that are emerging that are, are using the FIRE um, model for that. So it, it plays a very important role. Um, I think it's just important to recognize the reason why there's an I2B2 and there's an Odyssey out there was the concept of, of shifting from a, 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 a exchange standard to an analytics standard with respect to data representation. And I think FIRE is trying to bridge that. Um, but I, I think we all have to wait to see if, if, if there's a uh, momentum in terms of building communities around that. Do you have any other uh, thoughts, uh, Ricardo? Uh, I, we, we made some uh, experiences in using uh, FIRE on top of uh, both OMOP uh, and I2B2. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a very good uh, approach. It's another piece, uh, let's say, you know, of, the, of the puzzle that we can use as a, a, an enabler. As, that's what I, I see. Then uh, Thomas is certainly more expert than me because he pointed out this shift between the uh, let's say representation to analytics uh, that is uh, very um, compelling in a way if we want to improve uh, uh, the use of fire itself. But I found we found the uh, uh, fire a quite convenient uh, uh, tool that we can use for data sharing. Great. We have. Um... We have another question, which I think is about data standardization. I mean, the question itself is asking about, you know, how do we standardize different data? For example, similarity of slice thickness and other features. And I think it gets to the question of, you know, how can we deal with, you know, it's heterogeneous data in these advanced data sets. And what, what you know, if we're gonna push for, as you've suggested, I think, um, Ricardo, that, that we'll, um, we'll be looking at um, AI tools that might look across many data sets, but never have access to them. If the data is not standardized, how will we work? So, you know, are there, is there a solution to that? Yes, this is a typically hard, hard question because uh, as close you, you go to the data, as close to go to the uh, images and signals, uh, the, the more it becomes complex. Uh, the uh, sharing of the data, in particular, if you want to merge uh, sharing results of the analytics themselves uh, with uh, uh, and sharing the data. So uh, in general, I know I'm not an expert in image processing, but there are ontologies to try that tries to deal with the, the problem of representation. Uh, and there are also tools that are quite interesting to derive uh, meta features uh, from uh, from the images themselves that are uh, somehow a little bit more robust to uh, to the data collected themselves i'm thinking i'm thinking about uh, like these uh, transfer learning with the deep neural networks that are able to extract latent features with a fixed uh, uh, architecture of the neural network from the image that can be shared in a way and that are somehow more robust than the data themselves. But having said that, uh, I, I think that uh, this is a challenge. There are, there are uh, attempts to try to provide robust annotation of those two images. And, and Shang, do you deal with this at a global basis for trying to standardize data? Like how do you do it at Paracel? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, um, on, on NES, this is a, a prospective study. Uh, and uh, it's already in the protocol that uh, how the data will be organized. Uh, uh, so if it is uh, fr uh, from a big data uh, perspective, like it's a retrospective data, um, it's almost there is almost no way you can set, uh, you can standardize the data from different countries, even from the same country, <laughs> from different hospitals. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to yeah uh, to standardize that. So. Perhaps the best way is just to 
just do your best and then to record what are the factors, uh, what are the variabilities uh, from the data source. Uh, and uh, if possible, uh, we can uh, dig uh, deeper, trying to understand why. Uh, and uh, there may be a slim hope that if you understand why, you can do some justification <laughs> uh, in the data analysis, but that can be dangerous as well. Yeah, so I think it's uh, the best hope is for the prospective studies have a better design to have all the uh, data source using uh, following the same standard. That will be a much better solution. And there's another question about um, social determinants of health and are they being collected and analyzed in RWE? I don't know if any of the panelists have come across scenarios where that's been an issue for COVID-19. Nothing so far? Um, I haven't necessarily seen it specifically around COVID-19, but um, we've, we've watched a couple of companies that are, um, you know, healthcare facing a predicting risk that are doing some very interesting work around social determinants of health and, and understanding the barriers to care, you know, at, at the, you know, from a geographic standpoint. Um, and that's, you know, showing promise in terms of, of, of also informing clinical trials from an operational standpoint. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, those firms haven't thrown their hat in the ring um, regarding certain, you know, supporting certain aspects of COVID research. Well, if I just can add, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that our uh, local healthcare agency is dealing also with this aspect. They recently published a study about the Pavia area where I live, showing the different uh, uh, number of deaths in the different areas. And uh, there are several reasons why in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area that is so, so small as the Pavia area, we have three different uh, behavior of the three different, uh, um, uh, of the three different subregions. And uh, there are a number of uh, reasons, and one of those is certainly related to the social determinants. So uh, it's, it's a topic that in Italy is under study. And in my opinion, is also related to the topic of having a better, improving our system to manage people when they are at home, basically, that is uh, related with all these aspects. And I think this is the last question we have time for. Um, it's a nice, challenging one, which is, you know, what do you think will be required to advance the acceptance of real-world data, real-world evidence by regulatory agencies? And I'll frame it in the, the context of COVID-19. Is there going to be, you know, some progress because of COVID-19 around regulatory acceptance of evidence through RWD? Um, and, and, you know, what will it take to make regulatory groups look at this as sort of equivalent or capable at the same level as some clinical trials we, we've seen as the design of how most regulatory decisions are made. So I think Fang, you, you, Shang, you probably are the person who most gets close to regulators in terms of running clinical trials. Uh, well, um, I, uh, I think that uh, some of the components has already been used uh, um, for example, like we can take some of the uh, knowledge that we gathered from China using RWD, RWE, you know, uh, from, you know, how many days uh, does a patient progress from um, uh, the first symptom to diagnostic and uh, from diagnostic, how many average days to uh, to hosp uh, you know, to hospitalize, and from hospitalize to the ventilator. Uh, so all these parameters are from. Uh, if if FDA asks us, where do you get that data? <laughs> we have to tell them it's from China. <laughs> so so uh, so those are the RWD RWE already you know, from the clinical. Uh, the clinical aspects of it has already been used. Uh, uh, then some of the. Uh, some of the other aspects, like how to how to determine sites, 
uh, how to work with uh, the hospital uh, doctors and nurses. Uh, and some of our clients specifically uh, talk about, please do not add any burden to the nurse. <laughs> they are already very, very busy. <laughs> so, so we have, um, so uh, when we design a trial, uh, we have to think about that. We have to take that into consideration. Like, should we use E uh, CRF and the E consent and the, how to do that? And uh, uh, so, th so that will be welcomed by the FDA as well. But then there are other uh, things. Uh, for example, uh, if NIH said that we welcome those 16 companies to use single arm, single arm design without uh, placebo, uh, then uh, whether uh, FDA allows that. Uh, uh, so now they have this CTAP uh, program. So you can talk to them. And also FDA has, uh, has their own um, program. They, so they have allocated some money uh, <laughs> to propose some grant and uh, they invite you to apply for those grants for RWD and R RWE uh, to have some uh, correct inference on the decision making um, for FDA. So if appropriate, uh, I think they are open. They are open and, and, they, real, and uh, they really recognize uh, the importance of RWD and RWE uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, especially for some of the R RCT, the RCT is not, at some time, it's not even possible when doctors and nurses, they are helping the, uh, their patients uh, full time. So it's not even possible. It will be pr pragmatic. So if, it, if it's pragmatic, then RWD, RWE will be in the center of those pragmatic trials. So, so, so that is a fact. Uh, I think better communication with FDA will be very important here. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tom, maybe you have a last word because you, you, you've been close to Reagan Udall and FDA at some point in your life. <laughs> but there's, there's clearly a, a regulatory science component of this. And, you know, I think the agency and a, a lot of the advocates, you know, that are that that believe in the traditional ways of clinical trials are looking for um, equivalency. Um, and if we just go back and look at where we are with active safety surveillance today um, around drugs, it, it, 10, 15 years ago, there wasn't sufficient empirical evidence that the studies were repeatable and, and that they, they brought you to the right decision regarding the endpoints. So there's a lot of work going on today with FDA and with the community around the regulatory science dimension of RWE. And that's where I place my hope. Um, you know, do, informed, do you think, informed new ways of, you know, new yeah. designs and new approaches. Do you think COVID-19 is gonna help accelerate any of this? Like, is this gonna now, when we wake up, just like telehealth suddenly arrived, will RWE have arrived or not? <laughs> Um, I, I, I think that you will see uh, a lot of uh, ingenious approaches to close clinical trial enrollment gaps with uh, use of RWE to augment those trials. I think the industry will be bringing those forward. And, uh, you know, I think they'll follow the guidance that's out there so far. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, sometimes it takes, uh, uh, unfortunately, it takes a crisis to kind of accelerate <laughs> Um, thinking and uh, acceptance of new approaches, um, but you know, I do. I don't think standards will be relaxed. I think it, it'll just be crystal clear thinking about the equivalence, and does it demonstrate what's necessary to support the decision? Great. Well, I think we've uh, run up against the time we had allocated, and I, I'd just like to thank all of the panelists today. I know this has been. Uh, fantastic discussion from my perspective, and it's always enlightening to hear from different perspectives. Great to hear from places other than the U.S. Um, and so just thank you very much, and, and also thank you for all the people who attended and provided great questions. Um, we will have a recording, so if you have colleagues who are interested in hearing the proceedings and you can fast forward to the greatest hits of what we talked about, um, that should be available shortly. Um, and uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to uh, 
send belong to us and you know, we, we might be able to have additional answers. So thanks so much. And we're gonna close out the webinar now and uh, maybe we'll have another of these soon.